Hello, everybody. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, greetings of peace. Uh, we're doing this uh, Quranic text, and I'm honored to be with you to, to cover the subject. Now, as you know, this is a, a very vast uh, topic because the Quran, uh, we believe, is a word of God, and it's a uh, its meanings are, are depth and has been contemplated over for centuries. And still the, the scholars, they say we haven't really penetrated its depths yet. So that being said, you know, what we're going to cover today is very uh, preliminary and it's, a, it's an introductor, introduction to the subject. Uh, and uh, what I'm hoping to cover today is, is talk to you a little bit about the, the first moments of revelation and also, um, you know, focus on some of the concepts, some of the, the style and the language uh, that was that was used in the Quran and how it impacted the Arabs of the time and continues to do so today, and also maybe focus in on some of the major major concepts uh, such as the oneness of of being and and the unity of of the divine, and so so that being said, uh, let's get started. Uh, the origin of the Quran actually, you know, most people they they trace it back to Prophet Muhammad. But the story of the Quran is actually, it goes beyond that. It goes before that and uh, to the time of Abraham, uh, Prophet Abraham, uh, as you know, Islam is an Abrahamic religion. Uh, he was commanded by God to take one of his wives, uh, uh, Hajar, with, his, with her son, Ishmael, and take them and leave them in the middle of the desert. And this is a, a similar story has been narrated in the biblical version. Uh, contrary to the to the biblical image of Prophet Ishmael, uh, the Quran affirms that he was a, a pious person, a righteous person, who settled in Arabia and uh, started to to have family there uh, with the the tribe of Jurhumites from Yemen and became Arabized. And uh, you know, and he was of a of a nature to be able to you know he was willing to give his life for the cause of the faith. And are you not able to hear me? We can hear you. Okay, uh, maybe it's maybe it's the the speaker on your computer. Okay, uh, so uh, Prophet Ishmael then uh, is known to be you know from the, one of the sons of Prophet Abraham. Abraham had two sons that went on to to be father for for generations of prophets. I all the prophets that came from after him, it came from his lineage, and majority of them were from the lineage of Isaac. And Ishmael being secluded and separated from the rest of the, the prophethood, uh, he, his lineage kind of uh, died out. And, uh, you know, we have a verse in the Quran where Abraham is praying to God after building the, the, the place of worship called the Kaaba, that, you know, save my descendants from, from falling into sin and from worshiping idols and grant them, you know, mercy from yourself and bring them a prophet from among them. So <clears throat> the story of the, the Quran starts from, that prayer of Abraham, and I would like to, to share that some verses from there uh, later on during the lecture. So what happens now, Prophet Muhammad, he's born and raised in Arabia in the city of Mecca, uh, also known as the Valley of Mecca. And as he's growing up, he's experiencing uh, the life there as, as an orphan and his, his family, his father, his mother, they, you know, his father died before he was even born. His, his mother, she died when he's uh, six years old. So he's Moving from household to household, his grandfather took him in, and then he died when he was seven years old. Then his uncle took him in, and so he's living in a, in a way he's an orphan, growing up and experiencing life there. And he notices that you know the, the Kaaba that was built by Abraham, the place of worship for God that was built by Abraham, is surrounded by idols, and Kaaba became kind of a trade center for Arabia, and it was also a religious center. Because the tradition of Abraham had been watered down and some of its aspect had remained, but majority has had changed over time. And uh, all the different tribes, they had elected to have their own different uh, version of God and they had their own idols and they would all bring their idols to the Kaaba to house them there. So it was known as the house of their gods. And every year there would be a pilgrimage. People would come from all around Arabia and they would visit their deities and they would they would offer sacrifices and they would bring with the merchandise for, for trade. And so this made Mecca a, a trade center with a, with a religious undertone. And Prophet Muhammad, even though he saw he grew up in this environment and he saw this, this practices, his heart never inclined towards uh, the worship of these idols. And uh, 
for the first 40 years of his life, he lived there and he gathered a reputation for himself for his truth, truth worthy, uh, trustworthiness and for his honesty. And they even gave him nicknames. And this is uh, recorded in, in the books of history that they would call him a Sadiq and Amin, the trustworthy one, the, the honest one. And at the age of 38, he started to really contemplate about life, about existence, about what this reality is about, because the signs of, of the divine was ever present for him. Everywhere he looked, everything he noticed, it was, it was all telling him of something that is greater than life. And so he wanted to get closer to that reality. And so he started to, to yearn for seclusion. He started to look for, for meditative moments and, and he found himself uh, a place on top of a mountain. Uh, there was a mountain named uh, Jabal uh, Nur, uh, named the mountain of light. And this is before Islam. So he used to climb up on this mountain and there was a, a cave there known as uh, Ghar Hira. And he would meditate there and he would contemplate and he would think about the, the society that he's living in, how to rectify their situation uh, because the, the, the social construct there was a tribal society. Uh, people were basically, there was always tribal wars going on, feuds going on, family feuds. The stronger tribes would overpower the weaker tribes. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a lot of uh, injustice taking place in terms of uh, morality. And there was also, uh, you know, there was a cultural aspect of everybody wanted their firstborn to be a son. And so, you know, if, if the firstborn happened to be a daughter, culturally, they were shamed and they, they were forced to actually uh, kill their daughters. And these practices were part of the norm. And Prophet Muhammad, he started to, to really reflect on how he can bring about change. But at the same time, he was, he was a nobody in society. He was somebody who kept himself. He didn't meddle in politics. He was illiterate. He didn't know how to read or write. And so he, instead of turning towards the worldly things, he would turn to uh, contemplation and reflection, and he would seclude himself in this cave. And this went on happening to him for, for about two years. He was doing this. And, and the, the, the uh, six months prior to receiving the revelation, he started having spiritual experiences that he was not able to explain. And he would see dreams that would happen the way he saw them. And these are precognitive dreams that we talk about in psychology and other studies. And he would, he would have these experiences where he would, he would see something and it would manifest in front of him just as he saw it. And this started to, to worry him a little bit and also made him uh, a recluse even more because he was not able to relate with people even more. And so he would stay in the mountain and he would stay there at, at a month at a time, taking his provisions with him until the, the reality that he was seeking uh, reached out to him. And one day he was sitting in the cave and he's meditating and he narrates the story. He said, he felt a presence appear in front of him, an overpowering presence, and the presence grabbed him and squeezed him and said to him, Iqra, read. And being an illiterate person, he said, I don't know how to read. And he said, this being, it grabbed him and it squeezed him and it crushed him. Almost, he said, my lungs were about to burst and it commanded him again, Iqra, read. And, and Iqra means read or recite. And he responds by saying, I don't know how to read. And it happens again the third time. He feels this constriction, this overpowering uh, weight on his chest. And he's told again to recite. And then the word starts to flow. Read in the name of your Lord who created. And he created mankind from a clot of blood. Read and your Lord is most generous. The one who taught the use of the pen. And he taught mankind what he did not know. And as soon as he hears these words, he's released and he's in a state of shock and panic. So he, he, he leaves everything he has in the cave and he rushes down the mountain. And, and as he rushes down, he goes home, he, he, he kicks open his door and he tells his wife, you know, cover me, you know, cover me up. And he wants to be embraced. He wants to be comforted. And his wife, she does just that. She, she covers him up and she comforts him. And she says, you know, what happened? You know, what, what, did, what happened? And he goes on to explain to her after he's calmed down. He says, you know, this, this happened to me on the mountain. I was grabbed by this presence. And he started to, to say these words to me. And he's under the impression that maybe he's possessed by some kind of demon or something happened to him. And she says, you know, or, or he's losing his mind. And she says, you are kind to your relatives. You you're, you're take care of the orphans, you give to your 
to the poor. You know, you, you're a good person. God would not do something bad with you. And so she seeks help and she goes and reaches out to her uncle, uh, Waraqa bin Nawfal, who was a, a scholar of, of Christianity, who was an old man, he was blind. And she basically brings Prophet Muhammad to him and she tells him, you know, uh, this is, explain to him what happened. And Prophet Muhammad, he recounts his experience. And after he tells him, uh, Waraqa bin Nawfal, he says, I wish I was a young man so that I could support you when your people drive you out. And Prophet Muhammad, he's, he's not able to comprehend what he's hearing. He says, my people will drive me out. You know, they, they love me. They have, they, they call me a sadiq, an amin, the trustworthy, the honest one. They have a lot of, he said, nobody came with, with this message that you're about to be given, except that their own people turned against them and they were driven out. And you know they they were fought against, and sure enough, you know that that happens. So, you know, the Prophet Muhammad's life as it unfolds, uh, you know, people turn against him. People turn, uh, you know, it turns even violent. He's driven out. He's exiled, and you know he starts to to seek for asylum somewhere else. But as his story unfolds, the revelation of the Quran starts to to come down upon him, and for twenty three years, his mission as a prophet begins from that moment in the cave, and the Quran had an incredible impact on, on the in the culture and society of Arabia because for one thing you know they were people that used to worship idols and their this was their bread and butter everybody brought their their idols there in the Kaaba and they would come and they would you know they would, they would bring with the merchandise and everything so this was the source of their trade the source of people visiting and the message Prophet Muhammad received was that there is no deity worthy of worship except the creator the one that, you, that, that created you, he's the one that you should worship, not the idols that you have built with your own hands. And this message was very heavy for the, for the Meccans, for the Quraysh, the tribe of Quraysh. And they fought him with everything they had. There was persecution and, and all these things. So we have a concept of prophethood. And this concept is, is, is uh, something to reflect upon. But, you know, I just want to share with you the, the verses before we, we dive into that. Uh, where is the share screen? Okay. All right, so can everybody see the screen? So this is verses from Surah Ibrahim. Uh, the word Surah literally means like a, a city with boundaries. And every verse of the, the Quran is known as an ayah. So, here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the God divine, is basically writing this love letter. You know, before the revelation even came, God is introducing that he's the one that's been doing everything for you. So he says, Allahu alladhi khalaqa samawati wal arda wa anzala mina samai ma'an. It is Allah who created the heavens and the earth and sends down from the sky water, causing the fruits to grow uh, as provisions for you. And he has subjected for you the ships for your service and sailing through the sea by his command. And he has subjected for you the rivers. In other words, he's making the, the, the ships sail upon the water, the rivers flow, all of it for you. And he has he's subjected the sun and the moon for your service, constantly orbiting. And he has uh, subjected for you the night and the day. And he has given you whatever you have asked for, whatever you have desired. And if you were to count the favors and the blessings of God upon you, you would not be able to enumerate them. But definitely the human being is, uh, you know, is, is unfair, is unjust, and, and ever ungrateful. So this is the divine introducing that, you know, before you even were created, before you were even brought to this world, before all of these things even existed, all this creation happened and it was created for your service. And, and this is to show the honor of the human being and the exalted station of this human being. But then here, the story of Abraham. And Abraham is now, the, the story zooms into this, the, the prayer of Abraham. Abraham, after you know, establishing the city for the worship of God, he's making this prayer. He says, oh, my Lord, you know, make this city a place of peace and security and, and protect me and my children from worshiping the idols. Now, of course, in Arabia, this ended up happening. So 
He says, Rabbi, inna hunna adlanna kathiran minan nas. My Lord, all these, this idolatry and worshiping, uh, bes you know, others besides you have misguided many people. Uh, and whoever follows me in their monotheistic faith, then they are from me. And whoever disobeys me, and whoever leaves this path, and whoever walks away from it, then he says, you are the most grateful, great, uh, most forgiving, the most uh, merciful. In other words, he's pray praying for all of humanity. You know, it doesn't matter what religion you're part of. He's praying for, for either you be guided to the straight path or you be forgiven. And he goes on to make this prayer. He says, my Lord, I have left my, my family in this barren valley so that they may, you know, near your house so that they may establish the prayer and make the, you know, so, so make the hearts uh, of believing people inclined towards them and provide for them with fruits for perhaps they may be thankful. So these verses, you know, uh, Abraham's life is being brought into focus that he settled his family there in this desert and he built this place of worship so that people would worship the creator. But now many, many centuries later, people had introduced idolatry and idol worship and, and many of his principles being lost. Now Prophet Muhammad was sent as a messenger to revive this 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 reality of, of prophethood. So in the, in, the, in the Quranic concept, then we have this concept of prophethood where the divine, when he created the heavens and the earth and everything, he didn't just leave the creation alone. Everything that is created from, from the skies to the earth, from, from all the blessings that you witnessed, you know, God mentions he created them all for your sake. And that being your, your external life is taken care of, but also internally the, the, the heart of the human being and the, and the spiritual life of the human being that is all also falls under the divine uh, care and the divine guidance. And so, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, he, he also reveals the, you know, verses and, and signs to the messengers and, and, and people that he chose to, to carry this message. Now, one of the interesting things is the Quran, when it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, its, its style, its, its, uh, its way of delivery it was, it was unique to the Arabs because the Arabs being in the desert uh, area, they had, they had vast imaginations. You know, when you're, when you're deprived of stimulation, you know, you don't have a lot of things going on and you have all you have in front of you is the vastness of the desert and the sky. Their, their, their attention and creativity had turned inwards. So they had become masters of the Arabic language and they had mastered the language to a degree that you know they they had competitions in in poetry they would they would have uh, you know people come and recite long qasidas they call it long uh, you know litanies and whoever would be the winner their poems would be hung on the walls of the kaaba and so they were they were at the pinnacle of their language and the quran is revealed to them and it challenges them in their language and this person who is an illiterate person who had no power no political authority nothing suddenly he comes bursting forth with, with words of, with such, you know, authority, you know, tell, you know, condemning idol worship, condemning oppression, condemning the, the way of life of the Arabs, and, and also introducing this, this new concepts that were unheard of for them, uh, such as the, the concept of life after death. They, they had no concept such as that. And this was shocking that they would be brought back to life after they died and become dust and bones. But the Quran is now introducing and shaping these, these ideas that, that were unknown to them. However, when you study previous scriptures, all of these ideas are present in the previous scriptures, in the, in the, in the Torah of the, the Jews, in the Injil, the, the, the Bible of the, the gospel of the Christians, all these same ideas were present there. And Prophet Muhammad is told that he is not uh, somebody who's, uh, who's, who's introducing something new, but he's confirming what was revealed before him. And so when the message started to be revealed, the Quran started to, to talk about things that happened in the past, naming different prophets, uh, naming different uh, events of history, and start you know, introducing to the, to, the, you know, to the people there about the, the, the reality of this world, the nature of mankind, the nature of the divine. And so all these ideas started to come, and the way it was delivered, it was like a stream of consciousness. The Quran it was not like an organized book that came in the, you know, with, with the chronological order in the beginning, this happened and then that happened. It was, it was almost like somebody talking to you and the ideas flowed one after the other. And on the surface, it would look like they're unrelated, but upon deeper reflection, you would see that there's a, there's a themes that's being connected. And so 
uh, even the the way it used the words and the way it used the the language itself, the Arabic is a is a you know Semitic language, uh, and its sister languages are, are Aramaic, Hebrew, and and the way the language is formed, they 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 have two major type of words. They have verbs and they have nouns, and the Quran is now using those same same language, and and every word is made up of three letters, triliteral root. And all the different words are derived from, from three letters. And so one word, for example, hakama. Hakama means to rule. Uh, you can have a, a derivation, hikmah, which means wisdom. You can have a derivation, hukuma, which means uh, a, a government, a hakim, a doctor, or a wise person, a hukum, a law. So the Quran is using these words in a way that the Arabs, they recognize it is Arabic. But also, it's used in a, such a unique way that the Arabs, they never even imagined to use these words in, in those ways. And the Quran also had verses that were, that were baffling to the Arabs, and, and, and it was just letters, you know, alif, lam, mim. And so when the Quran started to present its concepts in the way that it did, and, and with, the, with the rhetorical devices that it did, you know, the Arabs, they were, they, were, they were baffled by this, but also at the same time, they were mesmerized by this. And they, they started to accuse Prophet Muhammad of, of you know, doing witchcraft or, or, or communicating with, uh, with the jinn or other things. But what, what, what was interesting is the Quran started to not only talk about the history of the Arabs itself or things that were, that were kept secret, that were being exposed, things that were in the hearts of the people or, or private conversations that had taken place. But also the Quran started talking about events of the future. Uh, things that will unfold and they have they came to pass. They, it started talking about, uh, you know, the nature of the world, the the, the, the scientific inquiries that we have today, uh, you know, about the, the phenomenon that happens in the natural world. The Quran started talking about those, the development of the embryo or the uniqueness of the fingerprints and, and all these different things. And what started to, what started as, as, a, as, a, as a initial, uh, challenge and and you know the, the Quraysh they started to realize this is this is something they cannot fight against so they they had these meetings to say what are we going to say to to discount this word what are we going to do to to uh, to discredit the Quran and they they had certain ideas first they wanted to call Prophet Muhammad a liar they wanted to call him a, a fabricator but they their own people would stand up and say, we can't say he's a liar. He never lied to us about anything. Even today, we, we trust him with our, our belongings. We leave our, our things with him and he's trustworthy. And all of our life, we never experienced him lie. Now suddenly he's going to come and lie about something major like this. So they themselves would trump their own ideas. Somebody else would propose, let's say this is a, that he's lost his mind, that he's gone mad. And, and another one would stand up and say, we can't say he's mad because Look how he is. He's, he's a functional human being. He's doing everything. And we know what mad people look like. So they have all these different concepts. But finally, they came up with, with their own argument. They said, let's say this is not a divine revelation. This is a word of a human being. And the reason it's so effective is because it is magic. And this is what they, they went with. They said, this is magic. And they would, they would go on the pilgrimages and warn people. If you hear a person named Muhammad reciting, do not listen to him because he will cast a spell on you and you, your life will be ruined and, and all these things. But you know, it, it happened, one of the cases, one uh, Bedouin, he came, he was a chief of a tribe and he was a famous poet. And he entered uh, Mecca to perform his pilgrimage and, and the uncle of the prophet, Abu Lahab, he was against the prophet. And he came and he warned him, he said, you, if you hear my, you know, this is my nephew, he's, he's doing magic. And if you hear him, you know, run away, don't listen to him. So the man, he, they filled him with fear. And he comes around the Kaaba and he's, he's doing the, the worship, the circumambulation. And he hears Prophet Muhammad praying and he's, he, he finds the words amusing at first. And then he remembers this is what they warned him about. So he stuffs his ears and he runs away. And as he's running, he says, he's, I said to myself, you know, I'm, I'm a poet. I know about words. You know, I know about uh, the, the power of language. You know, if, if I find what this man is saying true, I'll, I'll believe him. If not, then I'll reject him. You know, words can overpower me. So he goes back and he listens to the prophet and he hears what he had to say. And suddenly his heart is changed. So these kind of events, they kept on happening. And the first people to believe in the prophet's uh, message, to believe in the message of the Quran was the, the weak people who had no tribal support. 
people that were slaves, people that were oppressed, because the Quran started talking about social justice. The Quran started talking about uh, all people being created equal in the sight of God, about how it's not your status in this world that determines your position with God, but the, rather the content of your heart and your character. And the Quran started talking about, uh, you know, condemning the acts of injustice that was taking place about killing of the of the, the children, the killing of the daughters. And so this started to appeal to the to the to the weak ones in the society, the slaves who were the underdogs, but the ones that saw they had a lot to lose were the people that were merchants, the people that were in charge of the political power. They thought if we do away with all our idols and worship one God, who's gonna come and visit the Kaaba? Who's gonna come and do a trade with us? Who's gonna come and do this? So for them, this message was destructive in nature. And uh, they, they fought with, with the prophet and his message to, to the last breath until they couldn't. Uh, and and we, we will talk about that in another, another setting. But going back to the, to the message of the Quran then. So the themes of the Quran, it focused mostly uh, on, on the nature of the divine and on the, in the purpose of creation, the, the reality of man, what is human being? Why was he created? What was his purpose? And, and why, why, where is he going to? Where are you going to? Uh, and so, so the Quran start addressing the questions of, of uh, uh, why we, we exist. What is this life about? And, and what are you supposed to be focusing on? Where your energy should be going towards? And as it started to, to reveal these messages, the Quran employed certain methods to present these messages. Uh, our, uh, the scholars, they divided the Quran into the cate three categories. They said the first one is mostly talking about the divine and the reality of God. And, and the reality of the hereafter, so these things. And the second portion was talking about the laws of do's and don't. Uh, how should we conduct our life? What is the, what is the proper conduct? What is the, the lines we draw in terms of morality? What is the right thing to do? What is the wrong thing to do? How do we establish the rights of worship, the rituals? And then the third aspect was the stories of the, the, the previous nations, the people that had passed, uh, the other prophets like Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and, and what challenges they faced as a prophet and what, uh, you know, as, as their prophets brought this message and what their community's reactions were and how the, the divine dealt with these societies. And so as the Quran was being revealed then, uh, it had an incredible impact because it was calling the people to something greater than what's in front of them. For example, the first words to read, Iqra, read. What should you read? And, and, and the, the, the context that's being given in the Quran is everything in the heavens and the earth, everything that you see, everything that you experience are actually signs from God. The creation, it cannot happen. There is no accidents in the creation. There is no coincidences. Everything that happens, everything that manifests, everything that comes in front of you is there with a purpose and is there for a reason. And so the Quran was telling them that the creation itself is a sign. You yourself is a sign, you know, your own existence has within it uh, realities and mysteries that if you were to contemplate and reflect on it would bring you to a higher level of understanding. For example, why do you exist in time? And what, is, what does it mean that you're moving forward? And where are you going in, in, this, in this journey of life? And what happens after death? So all of these things, if you were to reflect on it, the Quran talks about how all the creation is then made subservient to this human being, but the human being has been created with a highest purpose. And so we, we just wanna talk about the final concept that I wanted to talk about today. So the concept of, of prophethood is, is deeply embedded that the divine did not leave this creation hanging, but is always communicating with the creation through the creation itself, through their own being, but also the highest form of knowledge through revelation, a direct knowledge infused into the heart of the messengers and the prophets and the chosen uh, servants. And then finally, the concept of, of oneness that I wanted to talk about. So in the Quranic view, uh, you know, the Quran, it basically revolves around two things. La ilaha illallah, that there is nothing worthy of worship, your devotion, your attention, except the creator. And that there is a, a prophet named Muhammad, the, the, the messengerhood of prophet Muhammad. And in these two, two concepts, the first one, la ilaha illallah, this is common across all the different prophetic uh, traditions. Every prophet came and they taught worship the creator, the one who had, you know, who had, you know, who had endowed the world with everything that it has. And this concept uh, has few different approaches to understand, but the Quranic view is 
everything that exists is from the divine, including your actions, including your will, including your intentions. Everything that unfolds is there with a divine purpose. And so there is nothing that exists or that can exist that is outside of the, the knowledge and the power of the divine. So the Quranic worldview then was bringing the people to the understanding of this oneness, that all the humans are created from one soul. Ya ayyuhal nas, O mankind, inna khalaqnakum min nafsin wahida. I have created all of you from a single soul. Wa khalaqa minha zawjaha. Then from it, we created its mate. And that's when duality came into existence. Wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisa'a. Then we created from them multitudes of men and women. But the essence of all of it was one soul. That all of humanity is one humanity. That all of you belong to one family. That the entire creation is you know, governed by one deity, by one God. And every, this oneness then, you know, as, as, as it is understood and, and you know, uh, as, as people that, that experience the, 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 the message of the Quran at a very deep level, they came to realize that every aspect, every minute detail of your life, of my life, every meeting that we have, every word that we utter, every action that we do, whether it is good or bad, whatever it is, it is to reveal the nature of the divine to the world. And so in the Quranic worldview, the divine created everything to be known. Uh, and, and it's a saying among the, among the scholars that you know, God said, I am a hidden treasure. I was a hidden treasure and I wished to be known. So I created the heavens and the earth so that I may be known. So the world then became a theater of divine attributes to, you know, it's a show of divine attributes. And, and in the Quran, God has multiple names. Uh, you know, call him Ar Rahman or call him Allah. All the beautiful names belongs to, to God. And, and so whatever you call upon him with, all of his names are, are names of beauty. In other words, uh, everything in the creation then, according to the Quranic worldview, is a manifestation of the divine names. And so somebody commits an act of sin. Somebody commits an act of sin. Prophet Muhammad, he said, if you stop committing sins, God would do away with you and produce another creation who would sin and repent so that he may forgive them. In other words, the purpose of sin was for, for people to experience God's forgiveness. God, the purpose of hardships was for people to experience God's uh, you know, rescuing of them and lifting of the hardships. And these are all divine names in the Kashif al Dur, Ghafir al These are names in the Quran that God is described with. Uh, somebody, you know, even in your own you know, experience of the world, you're able to see your vision is actually from name of God, Al-Basir, the one who sees. And so in order for you to know the one who sees, you're given vision, a small portion of that divine name so that you can understand what does it mean to see and who is the one who sees. Uh, you're given hearing in, the, in, in one of the name of God is as sami the one who hears. And so we have names in the Quran mentioned, Allah, who is his Ar-Rafi, the one who raises. And so when you sit on a chair, you're elevated. Uh, normally we would say the chair is the one lifting you up, but you know, it is in reality, according to the Quranic worldview, it is God doing everything. And so in the Quranic message, then the, the world can be viewed in two different uh, modes. The first is a horizontal in terms of the means that exist in terms of the, the things that is created and, and the vertical view in terms of God directly causing everything to happen. So if you look at it from the horizontal view, the existence of time and the in the chain of events that take place with if, uh, effect, you know, with everything, you know, leading to something else and the in the continuity of the moments. This is naturally experienced when the people are not aware of the divine. But when you look at the view in the vertical in the vertical sense that everything is happening in this moment, it is a brand new creation from God. And and the and the scholars of of the, the the theology of Islam and the Gnostics. They said that if you think you are the same person who walked into the room, you are mistaken. Every moment is a creation made over, you know, brand new. And so, so they are in a state of perpetual awe, experiencing everything. And, and it's very similar to, to the concepts that you find in the, in the Eastern tradition, that you cannot cross the river in the same place twice. In other, more, in other words, every moment that you experience is a brand new creation, is a brand new moment. And so now is all you have. This moment is your life. The past is, is memories that, that has gone and, and the future doesn't exist until it, it happens now. And so 
in the Quranic uh, view of a definition of a believer, then God says, you know, Ala inna awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. No, without a doubt, the, the, the servants of God, there is no fear upon them and there is no grief. It is those who have faith and they, they uphold their faith, they practice their faith. And so our, our scholars, they, they commented on that. They said the two things that God mentioned about them is they have no fear and they have no grief. And these are both function of time. That if you were to dwell on your past, you may experience grief. You know, certain events that happened in the past, certain things that happened, certain calamities, certain tragedies, and that's going to produce fear, uh, uh, anxiety, and it's going to produce grief because of those things that happened. And, and many people, they, they, they go through life saying, you know, I can't be happy because this, this thing that happened in the past. And, and fear, of course, is related to the future. And, and it has degrees of fear, such as worry, anxiety, uh, you know, terror and, and, and horror, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow? Is the world going to end and all these things? So if you live in the horizontal mode, this is the experience of majority of human beings. But in the Quran, God is inviting people to live in a way that you are connected with the divine and you experience time unfolding and the divine wisdom unfolding in every moment. And so in the story of Prophet Abraham, when he challenges uh, the people uh, that, you know, it is God who controls everything and he's the one who has the power and he's inviting his family to monotheism and he smashes their idols. They become very angry with him and they say, if you think God is the one who's doing everything, then ask him to save you from the fire. And they, they build this huge fire and they throw Prophet Abraham into the fire. And the, and the Quran affirms the story that Prophet Abraham, when he landed in the fire, God commands the fire. He told the fire to be cool and peace upon Ibrahim. In other words, in our experience, fire has the effect of burning things. But in the Quranic view, it is not the fire that burns, but it is God. And so if God wants, he can suspend all the laws of creation, all the laws of physics, everything that you know of, that you function with, everything, all the things that we have built up as idols besides God, he can God get rid of them in an instant. And, and all that remains is, is the ultimate power of God. And so the, the promise in the Quranic view is that in the life to come, you will experience that dimension of reality in which everything you, you, you experience, everything you imagine will manifest immediately in front of you. But in this world, because it's known as Darul Hikmah, the world of wisdom, then things are allowed to unfold in a, in a, in a systematic way. And so the Quran then, you know, as it starts to introduce these concepts, and I know there's a lot to talk about, and we didn't even scratch the surface of the thing. And, and you may have noticed that I was jumping from topic to topic to topic, and I did that on purpose, because this is the, the way the Quran delivers the message. The Quran is, you, you'll, as you're reading it, you'll notice uh, at some point it's talking about Prophet Abraham and his story. And then suddenly it's talking about idolaters. And, and, the, and the evil atrocities that they're committing. And then it's talking about, you know, the laws of inheritance. And then it's talking about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Prophet Moses dealing with Pharaoh. And so you'll see that it's like a stream of consciousness. But what's interesting about it is as you study it and you reflect on it, uh, you find that its verses are very well knit. It's one of its description in the Quran, or Quran al-Hakim. It's very well knit and they all go together with each other. And we'll talk about the mathematical uh, discoveries that happen later. But, you know, uh, just to take the first chapter, the second chapter of the Quran, for example, the second surah is known as Surah Al-Baqarah, the surah of the cow. If you study that, uh, that surah thematically, at first it's talking about, you know, the, the, the introduction to different types of people that exist in the world, the believers, the hypocrites, the disbelievers. And then it goes on to tell, you know, tell the story of the creation, the story of Adam. And then it goes on to talk about the previous nation that was chosen to carry this message and the laws that they were given and the rules that they were given and the transgressions that they did against their prophet and, and all these things. But then in the, in the middle of the, the, you know, in the, in the middle of the surah, it says, ummatan wasata. And thus we have made you the middle nation. And then it's talking about the laws that's given to this nation and the rulings that they have to do and fast this month and, and, and you know, establish the prayer and give charity and all these different rulings. The entire surah is 286 uh, verses, ayat. 
And it was revealed piece by piece to Prophet Muhammad over the span of 10 years. And, and the nature of the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad, he didn't write down the Quran. As he would receive it, he would recite it. And as he was recited, people would memorize it. So in one go, there is no editing, there is nothing going on. He would receive the verses and he would recite it and people would memorize from him just as they heard it. And in 10 years, they got this, this, this uh, you know, the surah, the surah revealed over 10 years. 286 verses in verse 143, exactly in the middle, God says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And thus we made you the middle nation. And so, you know, we've been talking for about 45 minutes now. I don't know what the middle word that I said was, but there are things like this that, that are there in the Quran, aside from the, the, the scientific things, mathematical things, historical things, even though the Quran contains all of those uh, types of, of, of information and knowledge, the Quran doesn't lend itself to be a book of history. It doesn't lend itself to be a book of uh, science. It doesn't, because there's no landmark historical markers or things that you could say, oh, this is talking about this king or this era. The Quran kind of tells the stories to deliver uh, some kind of wisdom as it relates to our life and how we should how we should conduct ourselves. And so it, it, it claims that it is a book of guidance for those who wish to be conscious of God. And, uh, you know, and all these other things are there just to strengthen the faith and strengthen the belief. And, and finally, I'm going to wrap this up with, with the one ayah in uh, Surah Yasin, which is the 36th chapter of the Quran. God talks about uh, the orbit of the, the stars and the sun and the moon and the, and the different planets. And he says, And each one of them is orbiting in their own, or swimming in their own orbit. And what's interesting, they discovered later as the Quran is being written down, uh, that the word, they're, they're orbiting, they're swimming in their orbit. If you were to take the letters of it and spell it out, is, is a palindrome. First letter is kaf, uh, second letter is lam, third letter is fa, fourth letter is ya. Fifth letter is uh, la, uh, fa, lam, kaf. So kaf, lam, fa, ya, fa, kaf, lam. And, and it's almost like the letters are circling. It, it reads the same, forward and backward. And there are these kind of things that you find in there. But uh, ultimately, you know, when you when you study the, the Quran, uh, one of the things are, are, are people, you know, the people of, you know, the, the, the religious piety and the, and the people that study the Quran, they said, if you come to the Quran thinking you know, the Quran is going to be a source of misguidance because it's going to, it, it will reject you. But if you come to the Quran with humility, wanting to learn its way, wanting to learn its message, the Quran has depths of meaning that, that as you reflect on it, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And uh, the, the, the scholars, they practice something called tadabbur, where they would take one verse and they would repeat it all night. And as they would repeat it, and they would repeat it, and they repeat it within their own consciousness, they would find the depths of its meaning deepening, and uh, and and the experience of that verse would be so profound and so so heavy that you know they, they would be able to write books about just one verse. And there's many many books you know focusing on just one verse here or there. So uh, if if you choose to study the Quran or at least look into it, I I, I do advise that you go unbiased and just see what it has to say. And you don't have to read it from beginning to end. Just open anywhere and start reading. Uh, because the Quran is, again, uh, it's not organized in a, in a chronological manner. Even though when people came and told Prophet Muhammad, he said, you know, we will, you know the, 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 the Jews and the Christians, their books are organized like this. Can God do that for us? And an entire chapter of the Quran came down in that exact fashion. Uh, chapter 12, talking about the story of Prophet Yunus from the beginning of what happened to the story unfolding and him being imprisoned and being sold into slavery and all these things. And then at the end of the story, God said, and these are news of the unseen that you were not there to witness. And we revealed them to you to enlighten you, but it is God who guides to the, you know, and so place your trust in God. He's the one who guides. But then he went on to, you know, in other words, he said, you want it like this, I can do that. But there is a reason the Quran is in the way that it is. And so, so it is to cause us to reflect and to think and to contemplate on it. And I'm going to, to end my lecture here and open the floor for question and answers. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to, to post any question you have and we'll try our best to answer that.
Any questions? You can post it in the chat. I think you've given us so much to reflect on. And so I think the questions will come in slowly. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing you really, uh, which talked to me was that you talk of total submission, I think, yes. which seems to be the most important thing here. And that God is forgiving. And I think that's true for so many of our religions. It is, yes. Uh, one of the, the views that's found in the, in the Quran is that every, every nation in, received a prophet. And every nation, somebody came and asked Prophet Muhammad, how many prophets did God send? He said 124,000. And 313 of them received revelation in, in the form of scripture. And so, so the, you know, there is a lot of consensus and in debates about different uh, religions, but they, they believe, our scholars believe all of them had divine origins, every one of them. Uh, that, that is ancient religions that have a scripture. If you, if you dive into it and find out the concept of God, uh, all of them, they go back to, to, to oneness. They all lead back to that, even though on the surface it may appear different, but the, the underlying theme is always it's, it's one, one uh, power, one divine unity. Um, and this is the message of the, of the Quran also, as uh, la ilaha illallah, that there is none worthy of worship or your devotion or your attention except the creator. Thank you. There's a question here. It says, if Quran was meant for all mankind, then how were non-Arabic speakers supposed to understand it before translations were available? Very, very good question. So uh, this question, if the Quran was revealed, let's say in Farsi or in English, people would ask the same question. You know, if, if it's meant for all of mankind, why is it in English? So, so a language was chosen um, to express the, the divine will. Uh, however, the language of the Quran being Arabic, Arabic was, is, is a very rich language. And, and of course, all languages are, are rich, but the Arabs in particular, uh, if you study Arabic, you find that it's very systematic. It's a uh, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult language to tame because of the level of uh, detail that you have to get into. And like I mentioned about the trilateral roots and also the language itself lend itself to theology. So, for example, within the Arabic language, there is uh, two schools of grammar uh, in, in the Kufan and Basran school. And they argue about how did the language originate? Was it first verbs or was it first the nouns? And so the people that hold the view that the verbs are the original essence of the language and the nouns came later, they are of the theological opinion that the world is a divine action that is being played out. So God is doing something. And so everything that you see is God's work. And the people that hold the view that the world, the, the language is built upon nouns and the verbs are there to connect them, uh, you know, the, they're of the view that the world is a manifestation of the essences. And so the divine, you know, is, is manifesting his essence and his names. And this is what you see is this divine drama taking place. And so, so depending on which view you take, there's a lot of, you know, subtleties in the Arabic language. And the Quran also, promises that we have made the Quran very easy to understand. Is there anyone who wishes to, 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 to learn it? And so, uh, and, and don't take my word for it. You can try this on your own. If you go to the Quran or, or any Arabic wanting to learn the Quran, uh, you will, Arabic will come easy to you. And I, I'm not an Arab, but I've learned Arabic within a within couple of years. I'm not able to speak it, but if I open the Quran, I understand it. And this is, this is just strange. But a lot of people will attest to that. Um, and, and lastly, uh, the Arabic language uh, is preserved from, because of the Quran, the Arabs, they were, you know, language by nature, it, it changes over time. And, and it, it, it changes in a way that, you know, what was uh, far out, you know, and, and hip is now swag. You know, so, so, you know, as, as cultures change, as, as generations come, we introduce new words, we borrow words from other languages, uh, or we make or we coin new terms. Uh, Arabic, uh, because of the, the, the level of the Arabic language at the time of the, the revelation of the Quran, 
and the and the the engagement of the Arabs with their language at that time, they had all these poetry that was just at the beginning of their their historical time. So all their poetry is preserved, uh, how they spoke, how they wrote, how all of that is preserved. Plus the Arabs within the first century they started making dictionaries of the Arabic language, a lexicon of the Arabic language called Lisan al-Arab, over 100,000 words. First dictionary of any languages, except maybe the Chinese, um, was in, in, in Arabic. And they also preserved the phonics. Uh, we call it the, the knowledge of tajweed, uh, how to, to pronounce each letter, makharuj al huruf So even the sounds of the Arabic language was preserved over time. So in a way, uh, Arabic was able to carry the message of the Quran, but at the same time, you know, there is an ayah, God says, Tell them if the entire ocean was ink and it was used to write down the words of God, the whole of the oceans would run out, but the words of God would not run out, even if you add to it another set of oceans to help it. So, so this is, uh, the, you know, one of the, views within the Quranic uh, is the Quran is an infinite uh, word of divine in terms of meaning, but it's now confined in a language that you and I can understand. And, and the language is preserved. Anybody wants to study it can study it. If not, the translation, we don't really consider it translation. We consider it interpretation of the translator. Because uh, whenever you translate, you cannot match the original language because there's always subtleties that are lost in translation. So I, I hope that answers that question, but that was a good question. Thank you. There's a comment here that says the Abrahamic traditions are fascinating in their similarities. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. They're, they're, they're the same. You know, if you go to their origins, they're all the same. Talking about uh, submission to the oneness of God, uh, living a moral life, uh, being of service to the humanity, to the creation, and uh, being representative of God on earth. You know, the Quranic view is that mankind is the Khalifa. Khalifa means an ambassador. So human, every one of us is an ambassador of God on earth. And, uh, you know, the ambassador is not the king, but he acts on behalf of the king. So uh, somebody sent a direct message to me. Uh, if it took almost 10 years for one surah to be written as others heard it through uh, prophet, peace be upon him, how long must it take for the... So, uh, the Quran was revealed, you know, over 23 years. Uh, not all of the, not all of the surah came down at once. S few verses would come down here and there, uh, sometimes from this uh, surah, sometimes from another surah. And the prophet was told that these verses that you have just received belongs to this chapter. And these ones belong to that surah. So, so even the, the organization and the order of the Quran was divinely guided and inspired and uh, he told us, peace be upon him, that every year Angel Gabriel would come and he would review with him what was revealed to him. And, and you know, so, so it's, it's passed down through memorization, not exactly through, through uh, written text. The written text only came into existence in the time of, uh, uh, it was an idea in the time of the Caliph uh, Abu Bakr, who basically witnessed uh, 70 of the, 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 the memorizers of the Quran get slaughtered in a battle. And so, so Omar, the second caliph, came to him and said, you know, if we don't write it down, we're going to lose the Quran. And he, he, you know, he was hesitant about the idea because he thought, why, sh why should we do something the prophet didn't do? And the Quran is being taught and memorized. And to this day, it's memorized. You know, children, they memorize it. Uh, anywhere, any city, there's people that have probably memorized it cover to cover. But uh, he was finally convinced by Omar, and then they started this project, and uh, it was completed and written and sent out in the in the time of uh, Uthman, which is the third caliph of, uh, of the Prophet, uh, and so who's also a companion of the Prophet. So one of his companions who was alive with the Prophet, who heard the Quran, he was the, you know in his time the Quran was compiled in the written form. But it was there as a, as reference, not not in the way that the Quran is taught. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, there's one more question which came directly to me. Uh, was the Prophet Muhammad the last prophet? Yes, uh, to, according to the Quranic view, he is the the last prophet and the last messenger to be sent. 
uh, with the with the divine scripture. And and of course, we also have the the view of the second coming of Christ. We believe uh, Prophet uh, Jesus he will return. Uh, but in the in the Quranic in the view, his return he will come and he will affirm the message of the final prophet. So even though chronologically he was born prophet before Prophet Muhammad and his his return will be after, you know, Prophet Muhammad. But the final revelation came to Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and so, so we believe there is no other revelation after him. Uh, uh, so, so the door of prophethood is closed. However, there is aspects of revelation that is still uh, active today. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, he told us, all of revelation will cease after me, except for 146th part. And they said, what is this? And, and he, he said, it is the true dreams that somebody sees or it is seen for them. So even today, it doesn't matter, a Muslim, non-Muslim, believer, non-believer, you can experience revelation in the form of a true dream. If you see a dream that happens to come true, just like you saw it. And we believe dreams have meaning. We believe dreams uh, in, in story of uh, Yunus, uh, Yusuf in the Quran is, is you know, is very, is around that theme of the, 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 the manifestation of dreams and dreams coming true so so prophet muhammad told us you know you can still see true dreams that are that are from god and so so it, it can happen to anybody thank you um, are there any other questions comments thoughts please share them now and just as a reminder we hope to see you here next monday august 23rd at 6 30 uh, when Imam Shweb Khan will look at some of the passages from Quran and address the purpose of human existence, question of life and death, and the problem of evil. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Imam Shweb. This was wonderful and so much to think and reflect upon. Till next time. Right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all for being here tonight. Good night. See you next Monday. Have a good evening. Us, it's just us now. Oh, you can't speak. One sec. Here you go. You can unmute yourself. I don't know. Okay. I, I think that went well. What okay, you thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it went well. I mean, it was like... Uh, you know, to the point, and uh, I mean, like we could just like walk walk through the whole, uh, you know, talk um, and relate uh, to it pretty well, actually. So yeah. I mean, it went uh, pretty much good, and uh, you know, hope to look forward to have that next continuation and that, like, you know. I think it will be fine, and yeah. uh, it's mm -hmm. cool. Um, so thank you for your question. I mm -hmm. didn't ask the other two because I just thought he, now people were getting ready, leaving. So I thought it's time okay. to be on sure. time. No, that's fine. No problem. I mean, they were like, um, at least able to like, you know, um, understand the flow. So, I mean, that's probably, I mean, they had some clarity on their mind. So that's probably, you know, right. Uh, so that, uh, that was the good part actually. So, um, I mean, like, um, so other than that, we are good to go again, right? For yes, with it, yes. With the setup and everything. Everything is oh. same and we'll and see same. you next. Yeah. Okay. Next. Thank you so much, Ravinder. Thank <laughs> you, my dear. Like, we are tiring, but go take a break now. And uh, break. But now it's time for dinner now. <laughs> dinner, exactly. Yeah, I mean, even now I have to go start actually, start cleaning the kitchen and start sorting yeah, out things. <laughs> Chalo, I won't keep you also. Take okay, care. take care. Thanks and one I'll more time. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Okay, bye.